Hey everyone, welcome back to the podcast and happy new year. It is 2021. It's January, one of the best months in my eyes, I think in most people's eyes to do a detox. Everybody wants to jump on a detox in January and for good reason, because December, we tend to overindulge and come January, we want to lose a few pounds. We want to detoxify for those of you that drink the alcohol that you drank throughout the month of December. So my guest today is the expert in toxins. I just finished reading his excellent book, The Toxin Solution. It is Dr. Joseph Pizzorno. He is a formally trained naturopath physician, leading educator, and founding president of this country's pre or the United States, not this country's <laughs> premier, because I'm in Canada, premier's natural medicine institution, Bastyr University. He has been involved in medicine now for almost half a century as a researcher, student, clinician, teacher, lecturer, author, and advocate at the local, state, federal, and international levels. He's taught tens of thousands of students and doctors, authored or co-authored 12 books, including The Toxin Solution, and written over 100 articles in peer-reviewed scientific journals, and cared for tens of thousands of patients, either directly or indirectly through sophisticated corporate wellness programs that he himself designed and helped implement. So welcome, Dr. Pizzorno. Well, thank you for the very kind introduction. Yes. Well, you gave me a bio that just did not stand up to what you actually, what your history and all your, all the things that you've done in your time. I think it's excellent. So good for oh, you. you. Are you retired now? No. No, no. Well, I'm retired. <laughs> I, lo I love what I'm doing. Of course not. Like what? I mean, actually, I need to update my bio because it's now over half a century I've been involved in medicine. Right. That was from your book. And this was written yeah. in 2017. So right, you're right. right. Yeah. So how can I ask how old you are? Um, my birthday uh, was, well, let me put it this way. I was born in 1947. So okay. I'll let you do the math. <laughs> Don't do that to me on the spot. Okay. Well, you should be probably be retired, but I'm glad that you're not. So what are you doing right now? Are you still in medical practice? Like, do you actually have a practice where you see patients still? I, I don't see very many patients. I mean, a little bit of concierge medicine, but my role right now is actually education. And I spend most of my time actually educating doctors. Wow. So I literally fly all over the world uh, teaching doctors that environmental toxins have become the primary drivers of chronic disease. Yeah. And, you know, you can get involved in nutrition all you want, which is great. But if people are full of metals and chemicals, they, they can't restore their health. You got to get, get them out. Yeah, I think I know. When I read that in your book, I just thought, wow, that really just sunk in a lot. For I didn't realize that. I didn't realize that it was the leading factor in chronic disease. So well, that, that's my opinion. You, know, yes, you look at the conventionals, they're not going to say that. But No, of course well, not. The data's on my side. <laughs> 100%. Yeah, 100%. So I love, I want you to tell the story, the Canadian story <laughs> of how you kind of got into all of this via one of the wealthiest men in Canada hiring yes. you. So yes. can you share that story? Sure. So obviously as a naturopathic doctor, I've always been aware of the importance of nutrition and in toxins in, in the effects on people's health. <clears throat> so I went from being aware of it as being important to realizing way, this is way more important than I thought when looking at toxins. So one of the wealthiest men in Canada, uh, Alan Markin, I uh, love him, great, great guy, uh, with his own personal generosity, wanted to improve the health of his employees. So he was a company called Canadian Natural Resources Limited, CNRL, mm -hmm. which I'm, I suspect most of your listeners know about. So um, he said to me, uh, so I want you to bring your naturopathic ideas into improving the health of my employees. I said, happy to do so. But I said, you know, well, I'm a true believer in natural medicine. I'm also very objective. So in order for me to determine what the best things are to do for your employees is I want you some lab tests. I want to check the nutritional status, I want to check their toxic status, just measure how, how the body's functioning, you know, check blood sugar, things like that. How much can I spend? <clears throat> and he said, blank check. Oh. He said, blank check. He yeah. said, yes, if you can convince me that the test is going to help my employees, I'll pay for it. So I did $1,500 of lab tests on 4,500 oil field <gasps> workers in Canada. <laughs> huge amount of data that's huge okay and what i found was i found some things that were surprising number one was 
way more blood sugar disorders than people had realized. Mm. Uh, and second, way more toxicity than I expected. So then, so this is all about 10, 12 years ago. So then I started diving into the research on this and I was stunned by what I found. So the first thing was diabetes. So when I was in naturopathic medical school half a century ago, diabetes affected only about one half of 1% of the population in North America. Now it's affecting 10%. And we're projecting that one third of adults in North America will get diabetes in their lifetime. What happened? We didn't change our genetics. And people will say, wait a minute, well, we're consuming too much sugar. Well, when you look at uh, sugar consumption, yes, we consume too much, too much sugar, but we've been consuming too much sugar for a long time and the diabetes didn't, didn't go up, which I was actually a little surprised when I found that. Mm -hmm. Because you know, eating a lot of sugar is not good for you. Then you would say, well, but everybody now knows it's obesity. Because obese people have way more diabetes than non-obese people. And the research in that is very clear. If you look at a morbidly obese woman, for example, she has a 60 times higher risk of getting diabetes than a lean woman. Mm -hmm. And same thing with men. Men is four times, 40 times as high. So wow, it must be obesity. But then I found this great study that looked at the toxin levels in obese people and then look at the rate of diabetes. And what they found was that obese people in the bottom 20% of body load of environmental metals and chemicals don't have an increased risk for diabetes. So wait a minute, diabetes, obesity is the strongest predictor of diabetes, but if the fat's not full of chemicals and metals, you don't get diabetes. Oh, that's crazy. So well, that's interesting. Yeah. And that then led me to write my book, The Toxin Solution, and also read me, led me to co-author a book called Clinical Environmental Medicine, a textbook that I wrote for doctors mm. to teach doctors to literally all the world. They've got to start thinking about toxins for their patients. Mm -hmm. Wow. And so what, so you tested all these guys. Can I know what tests you did? Like what, and would you still run those tests today? Like are these well, the I've gotten, standard I've gotten, tests? Yeah, I've got more sophisticated in this. Okay. So um, in the ideal, so here's the ideal circumstance. The ideal circumstance would, would, would be we do a needle biopsy of people, take out their tissues, measure what's in their tissues. And that's what really counts. And a big one is, for example, mercury. Yeah. And mercury causes neurodegeneration. So you want to take a needle into a person's brain, take out some brain cells and see how much mercury is in there. Yeah, right. You look at your face. Who wants to do that? <laughs> okay. Who wants to oh, take please. a needle in the brain? Yeah. <laughs> so now is it... Um, very, very expensive. It's also very, very invasive. So we have to deal with non-direct measures. So we can look at the amount of toxins in the urine. And that by right now is the least, it is the least expensive way of doing it. We can't test all the toxins, but we can test a lot of them. But the problem with testing toxins in urine, it tells us what we're getting rid of. Mm. It's not telling us what's stuck in the body. So in general, when you look at blood or urine levels of toxins, you're looking mainly at acute exposure or what the body's getting rid of. You don't know what's deep into the tissues. You don't know, what, don't know what's actually damaging metabolism. Now, I'm not saying they're not relevant. They're very, very relevant. But just because it doesn't show up in the urine doesn't mean it's not in the cells causing trouble. There's some great research done by um, a great clinician in Canada named Stephen Genuis. He, he practiced in Edmonds, uh, Alberta, Alberta mm -hmm. Edmonton, Alberta. And he did an interesting study. He took 10 apparently healthy people, put them in a sauna, got them to start sweating, and then measure what was in the sweat. And he found toxins in the sweat that were not in the blood and they weren't in the urine. The body had sequestered them in the cells where it's causing, it's causing damage, not as much damage as it was floating free, but it was there and, wow. and long-term damage. So these toxins are real, they're serious, and they're getting worse. Yeah. Well, so what did you discover with all this testing that you did with oh, these? So let me go further. Yeah. So I, I found, found lots, lots of, well, a lot of mercury, for example, chemical exposure, things of this nature. And so while the best is to directly measure it, we're now learning we can indirectly determine who is the most toxic by looking at uh, a, a blood test called GGTP. Now that's a fancy name. It's a standard liver enzyme. Oh, yes. and it used to be a part of a standard liver panel, although they don't use it as much anymore for detecting hepatitis. So it's an inexpensive test and it measures an enzyme that the liver increases the production of in proportion to toxic exposure. So a person exposed to mercury, GTT goes up within the normal range. 
you may say, well, I want to get my GTT test. And your doctor says, oh, we test your GTT, it's fine. Within the normal range, GTT goes up because the body's trying to respond to the toxins. So you don't think there's a disease because it's not a disease, but the body's being damaged, the body's reacting. So I now recommend people get the GTT tested. And then once they get a number, as they detoxify, their GTT will go down. And that way, you know, you're on the right track. Right. Yeah. So cheap. So, and so you might say, well, chemo, you know, oil field workers. Well, obviously oil field and oil industry must have a lot of chemical exposure. So that was what I initially thought. And I was finding all these examples and indications of chemical exposure. And then I started asking, well, what are these people actually doing? So they're not working in some manufacturing area of producing gasoline and things of this nature. These are typically guys get in the pickup truck, they drive out to prairies in Alberta and check to make sure the pumps are working properly. There's really heavy, thick crude. They have no, they have no exposure, no chemical exposure. I mean, occasionally a pump might be leaking, but most of the time there's no exposure. So I think, well, where is this coming from? So it turns out that a lot of them were working in the oil feeds to subsidize the family farms. Because with the modern agriculture, it's harder and harder for small farms to succeed. But what were they doing on those small farms? They were using herbicides and pesticides and all these various chemicals. So they're basically, many of them were actually farmers and it shows up, shows up, and shows up with blood tests showing they're toxic. Wow. So they're toxic producing the food that everybody else is eating. And that's Crazy. what got me onto this pat pattern. I started to realize, wow, look how it's toxicity. Then I started developing these protocols for detoxifying people and they got better. Very wow. interesting. And so were you allowed to test them after they went through your protocol? Yes, we tested them before and after, and we could see how toxicity was decreasing and people followed the protocol. Wow. Protocols. You're so lucky that you got that opportunity. Yes. Like that doesn't happen gone, often. gone further, but yeah. Uh, yeah, as with everything, the project ended, and, or I, I, my engagement in the project ended, and so I, there, I wish I could have had more years of data, but the initial data was very, very encouraging. Yeah, well, that's a nice boss, too. <laughs> I would have liked to have worked for him. Yeah, no kidding. So besides, if you know, if we're not working on a farm, Dr. Pizzorno, mm -hmm. where are these toxins coming from? Like, what are the main toxins that you're seeing in your patients? The toxins are coming from everywhere. They're in our food, in our water, in our air, health and beauty products, cleaning aids, basically get storage, storage uh, containers coming from everywhere. Mm -hmm. And one of the challenges, I think one reason why the researchers did not pick this up is because researchers focus primarily on industrial uh, toxicity, industrial exposure, high levels exposure. And that they did not realize that low levels of exposure over long periods of time have a huge amount of damage as well. So, and then also not, they're not looking at the kind of long-term chronic effects, but they tend to look at just one toxin by itself. They say, well, a toxin by itself is at low enough levels, not cause a lot of trouble. Who's exposed to just one toxin? Mm -hmm. So as I've done research, actually look at what's in the food and water and everything else, there are a hundred metals and chemicals in the environment at high enough levels to start causing physiological damage. So while one toxin, and eh, not too bad, it's not one toxin, it's a hundred toxin. And then they start adding up, and that's the all this disease. We suffer the heaviest burden of chronic disease in every age group ever in human history. But look at diabetes, half of 1% when I was in school. Now it's 10% of the population. Mm -hmm. Disease after disease showed the same thing. And we now have diseases we never had before, like mm -hmm. non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. That didn't exist before. Mm -hmm. uh, ADHD in children. Well, we may have occasionally had a hyperactive kid, but that wasn't much of a problem. Autism. We didn't have autism 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. Where you know, were all these, not, not only kind of the known diseases increasing, but all these new diseases popping up. Every one of them ties to chemical exposure. Yeah, so now, I wanna be clear, chemical exposure is not the only cause of disease, but I, I think it's now the biggest one. Yeah, that's unbelievable. And people, I think, assume that when their children are born, they're toxic free, but there's so much now being passed on from mother to child, isn't there? Well, if you want to get paranoid, and I'll, I'll say this to all the women out there <laughs> you who want, want to get, get pregnant, paranoid. okay, yeah. um, seriously, there, there's an issue you've got to deal with. 
Right. So this research that was done that looked at organophosphate pesticide levels in pregnant women and then looked at the IQ of their children. So organophosphate pesticides were our, our chemical that we spray on our food supply to kill insects by poisoning the neurological system. So the assertion was, well, so such low levels, uh, it won't cause trouble for humans and all humans have different detox systems and different sensitivities, so don't worry about it for humans. Okay, so first off, where were the first organophosphate chemicals produced? They were produced in Germany in World War I and used in chemical warfare. Oh, well, that's interesting. Oh, these aren't supposed to affect humans, yet they were used to kill humans. Oh, then, then we then look at, go back to these pregnant women. Look at pregnant women in the top 10% of body load of, environmental, uh, of organophosphate pesticides and look at the IQ of their children. Then look at women in the bottom 10% of organophosphate pesticide body load, look at the IQ of their children, and then mathematically, you know, wipe, you know get rid of the socioeconomic differences, you know, any, any fact we might know of that might be conflicting. The kids born to the children, or the children born to women with the highest levels of ground phosphate pesticides, seven point lower IQ. Wow. There's at least three studies that have all shown exactly the same thing. And one study followed these children, they never got it back. So what's happened is in utero, as the brains were developing, the brains are developing in, a, in an environment full of neuro, t- neurological toxins. Is it any surprise that the brains don't develop fully as well as it could? Mm-hmm. So pregnant women, I would say to you, spend a year detoxifying your body before you get pregnant to give your baby the maximum opportunity to be healthy. Mm-hmm. This is a, a very controversial subject. And I don't really want to get into it, but I've always thought with all the research I've done around vaccines that vaccines aren't necessarily a bad thing. What it is, is these our children are now being born full of toxins, some worse than others, full of, they get mums bacteria. So if you've got a bad gut and your baby comes shooting out of there, it's going to have the same gut bacteria that you have, which if it's compromised and you've got a toxic load that you've now passed on to your baby. And then on top of that, you give them a whole round as soon as they're born of vaccines that do have very strong chemicals in them, some of them. I think that that's what why we see some kids react to them is, is kind of my theory is that it's just, it's like, it's breaking this. It's like you're, the system's already so loaded and it's just the, the one, the thing that kind of, for some kids, that's what will trigger the autism or the ADHD or yeah. And that, that may be it. It, yeah. you know, vaccines obviously have a huge uh, clinical benefit, but there's yeah. plenty of adverse reactions as well. Yeah. And we need to do a better job of understanding who's going to react so we can yes. do vaccination in a more appropriate way for those people. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I, I have direct experience with one of my closest friends having a totally healthy child, got vaccinations and developed a neurodegenerative disease. Yeah. And, and sure, it might have been just accidental, but there's just too, there's too, just too much of it happening. We, yeah, we, we can't ignore it. Yeah, I always say, I don't think millions of mothers and fathers would lie about it, right? Like yeah. there, there is something there that needs to be looked at. Yeah. And so let's I'm, face it, you know, let's, yeah, not, let's, let's not throw it. away vaccinations, they're useful. Exactly. Let's just figure what the problem is and fix it. Yes, exactly. I, I couldn't agree more. But so let's talk about what, how it is that these toxins, because this was like my favorite part of your book, because I, before knowing how toxins affected blood glucose and insulin resistance and all of the creating insulin resistant type two diabetes. I didn't know any of that. And what I've seen in my own practice over the last seven years is there was these odd, the odd woman that I'd work with who was, you know, following the cleanest diet. She would be, you know, keto for three years with no sugar. Like, and I really believe these women, like they were like coming to me in tears going, I work out, I'm eating super well, I don't eat any sugar, I don't drink, I don't do drugs. I have insulin resistance, I have type two diabetes, I can't get rid of it. And I finally started to, to, to dig deeper and I started to find these just very small amounts of information that said that things like heavy metals, there was a correlation to diabetes. And then I read your book. I was like, oh, thank goodness this man is addressing this because I just I couldn't find enough information. So I'd love for you to explain how in the world is it that toxins and heavy metals can create diabetes? Yeah, great, great question. Um, and to just give you a hint about it, the, um, the researchers who are now looking at this uh, 
data on toxins and diabetes are now calling these things diabetogens and obesogens because mm -hmm. they induce diabetes and induce um, diabetes, obesity, diabetes. Mm -hmm. So what they tend to do, um, and phthalates are a good example, is they bind to the insulin receptor sites on the cells. So you have a cell, a special receptor site there that the insulin uh, talks to that say, okay, now let sugar in to cover it up. So what happens is the cells can't see the insulin. So our pancreas has to overproduce insulin to get the cells to hear the insulin signal, which is great. Good example of our body is incredibly adaptive. But when you overuse the pancreas for 20 or 30 years, by having to have put out too much insulin signaling, the pancreas burns out. And when the pancreas burns out, it can't over secrete insulin anymore. After all, it can't even secrete insulin at all. So you go from everything seems to be okay to except you're kind of gaining weight to now the pancreas can't keep up. Now we got diabetes and obesity and everything else. Yeah. And until you get rid of those toxins, then the, the it won't hear that insulin signaling, will it? Right. Yeah. It's very hard to hear the insulin signaling. Yeah. And so what are where are phthalates coming from? Health and beauty aids. When you wash your hair. I should cover my eyes because I just put makeup on. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. So the, the good news is that there are, there are low toxin health and beauty aids. Yeah. But the reality is that these things have lots of phthalates and things in them. And phthalates bind to these receptor sites. Uh, bisphenol A. Everybody knows about BPA. Direct correlation. You look at people's body load of BPA. Uh, as it goes up, insulin resistance goes up as well. Look at BPA levels. As they go up, body weight goes up as well. Yeah, that's, that's just crazy. I've also heard just recently done some research around, and, and I want to get into this too, is um, xenoestrogens, which are estrogen mimicking chemicals that are coming from plastics and, and beauty products and scented products and all of these other things. There's so many xenoestrogens in our environment uh, that they our body's receptors, estrogen receptor sites will will take the, the xenoestrogen over our own production of real estrogen, which that so scary. <laughs> Here we are, can be and, full and, and of what's, them. Yeah, and what's interesting about it, sometimes they'll turn on the receptor sites inappropriately, and sometimes they'll turn off the receptor sites. So what happens is our normal body's endocrine system, which has, you know, pituitary kind of controls the systemic and, and I say cyclic functioning, all of a sudden can't get the messages. Okay, and now the system starts dysfunctioning. So how does this show up when it comes to hormones, when and hormone imbalances these chemicals? What are you seeing? Oh, there's so many examples that we can look at. Um, well, let's look at something like PCOS, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay? Polycystic ovarian disease. But there, it's, it's a, uh, a huge challenge for women, particularly wanting to get pregnant. Yeah. And well, it turns out that these toxins cause PCOS. Okay, so there, there's, there's an example. Um, the, and when you look at the endocrine system, the data that's actually the strongest is thyroid. So many of these toxins actually impair the thyroid's ability to produce thyroid hormone, but the even bigger one is, so thyroid produces something some called T4 and T3. People mm -hmm. have probably seen that from their lab tests. Mm -hmm. Well, T3 is three times as effective as T4. So in the cells, when T4 goes into the cells, the cells then convert T4 into T3, and that's where the vast majority of thyroid activity happens. Well, many of these toxins poison the enzymes to convert T4 into T3. So while the blood levels might look fine, we actually look at what's going on in the cells, they're hypothyroid. So now when you're hypothyroid, more energy, more weight gain, and also being hypothyroid means the estrogen cycles don't work quite as well, so now you get more mystery irregularities. So this is one example. And... So my personal story I'll tell because, uh, and I would like to hear your opinion on this, is the effects of these chemicals then on, when, you, when that T4 is not converting properly to T3, are you seeing a rise in reverse T3? Because that's what happened to me is my reverse <laughs> T3 was really high. Yes, that you do see that. And I don't fully understand the mechanism, but I've seen that. And I'm going to be, I need to look into what the mechanism is, but you're exactly right. Yeah. So the reverse T3 then blocks the cells that re the receptor sites that respond to T3. Because mm -hmm. when I went 
when I discovered I was hypothyroidism and I then dove deep into, okay, well, why do I, why am I not? My TSH was always very normal, if not low. So they never caught it for a long time. And then I finally did my free T4, free T3 and saw that the T3 was very, very low. So, you know, I started taking my, my, my naturopath put me on some desiccated thyroid. I felt the best I'd ever felt. And then months later I crashed and I realized that my reverse T3 was went really high. So I wasn't converting T4 into T3. I was converting it to reverse T3. And I was like, why? So, you know, then I went into that and started digging. I thought, okay, I got to just start kind of knocking these, you know, the reasons why this would go up. I need to just start going through the testing. I did a mold test, nothing. Mm -hmm. So then I was like, you know, do I do heavy metals? And I'm like, I don't have any symptoms of heavy metal toxicity, I thought, well, I just need to rule it in, rule it out. So I went and did the ch a challenge test, mm -hmm. a urine challenge test. And I have no mercury in my mouth. I'm very clean eating. I eat organic. What do you know? I've got like off the charts levels of lead. I've got moderate amounts of mercury and I have cadmium. Cadmium, yes. And I'm like, yeah, so where the, the two, is this coming from? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So the, the two, I, I was curious to see what you're going to say. So the, the two that actually poison the uh, diatonase is the most are cadmium and mercury. Wow. And so the diodinase mm. is the enzyme that can helps convert T4 to T3. Exactly. So for those that don't. Right. And know. also it's highly dependent upon selenium. Mm -hmm. So if you have a selenium deficiency as well, you're even more susceptible to poisoning by those metals. Right. Yeah. And I figure like going back to what we were talking about earlier, mine must have been a lot from my mom, I think. Mm. I think my mom was full of mercury when she was pregnant with me. So I think that, I mean, I know you get mercury from the environment. I'm sure some came from that, but I think a lot of the lead and mercury came from her and I want her to get So you want to get really paranoid. This mm -hmm. is animal research. I don't have human research. Okay. If you do a biopsy of a pregnant rat with mercury toxicity and look at how much mercury is in their brain and then the same biopsy of the fetus, the fetus has more mercury than the mother does. No. So when I was in when I was in medical school, all the textbooks said, you know, the mother does everything she can to protect her fetus, make sure the fetus gets optimal nutrition and protect from toxins. The latest research is saying Mother Nature's decided that the mother's more important than the fetus. So a lot of the toxins are excreted into the fetus to promote the health of the mother. Crazy. So it makes it even more important for women who want to get pregnant. Do everything you can to decrease your toxic load because it will go to the baby. I mean, it's really, it's, it's really clear. Mm -hmm. So I'd love your opinion because one of the main toxins that we have, we see too are heavy metals. What do you do as far as there's a lot, so much controversy over testing for heavy metals. And then of course, chelating the heavy metals. There's some people that are like, don't ever do IV chelation. Other people follow, you know, the Andy Cutler protocol. There's um, things like citrus pectin and chlorella and all these other things. So what's your, I would love to know, cause you've been in this for so long, Dr. Pizorn. I'm sure you have watched so many patients get better and clear out their heavy metals. So I'd love to hear what you do in your practice for that. And so there are three key, key strategies. Number one, I know it's obvious, but I'm going to say it again and again. Don't let them into your body. Avoiding toxins is the, one of the most effective health longevity strategies people can do. Don't let the toxins in. Our bodies have tremendous ability to heal if they're not being wrecked by toxins. Okay. So that's number one. Number two is our body also has great mechanisms for getting rid of toxins. So let's do everything we can to support those mechanisms. So there's some simple things to do and some more sophisticated. Let's start with the simple ones. Every day, the average person excretes into their gut about, uh, about a half a percent. Let's say one, one percent, depends on research. Let's say one percent for easy numbers. About one percent of the total body load of mercury is dumped into the gut every day. That sounds good. We get rid of mercury. But then we reabsorb 99 percent of what we just dumped into the gut. So why would our smart bodies waste all that metabolic energy to get rid of mercury and then just reabsorb it? Because as those systems evolved, we we're eating 100 to 150 grams of fiber a day. So normally when toxins are dumped into the gut, they bind to fiber. How much fiber does the average person in North America eat today? 15 to 20 grams. Yeah. So we've fundamentally sabotaged one of, our, one of our main detox systems. So if nothing else, simply increasing fiber in the diet 
will uh, improve our ability to, get bodies, ability to get rid of not just the metals, but chemicals as well. Wow. Okay. Another thing we can do is everything we can to support glutathione. Glutathione is an incredibly important molecule in the body that um, is one of the, it's one of the main antioxidant chemicals produced in the body, but it also plays a huge role in getting rid of toxins, particularly mercury and particularly chemical toxins. So we will actually bind glutathione to mercury to get across the blood brain barrier, to get out of cells into the blood and get out of the blood into the gut. Okay. So improve uh, glutathione. And the easiest way to that is to either eat whey protein or take N-acetylcysteine, NAC, as a supplement. That'll increase the production of glutathione. Okay. Yeah. Now, the third strategy, and there's a lot we can do there, and the third strategy is we do have a specific toxin you need to get rid of and the body needs help, then there are some strategies. So if it's lead or mercury, I use a, a drug called DMSA. Mm -hmm. uh, DMSA is a relatively non-toxic drug or low toxicity drug, and it's a great way of getting toxins out. And I do it orally, not IV. Do it orally, low dosages, long period of time. It takes, it takes time to get it out, but you don't get the adverse reactions, don't get toxic reactions. So I'm not much into IV um, chelation therapy. Now I wanna say sometimes that is important and should be done. I prefer doing the gentler approach uh, to begin with. Mm -hmm. And then finally, we look at metals or chemicals. Uh, if it's really high levels, uh, yes, fiber will get rid of it. We can increase the rate of getting rid of the, uh, the toxins by using what are called biosequestrants. So biosequestrants, cholestomy, cholestyramine, things like that, were developed by the pharmaceutical industry to decrease cholesterol levels, and they do. But the high doses they use, they get a lot of side effects, you know, kind of oily, smelly diarrhea people don't like. But when used at lower levels, they also bind to chemical toxins. So PCBs, uh, polychlorinated biphenyls, really hard to get out of the body. And they have half-lives from two to 20 years. Wow. So in order, one of some of these things, you, eat, you eat, for example, you farm fish, you get some of these PCBs, that PCB is gonna be in your body. If it's a 20 year half-life, it will take 80 years to get rid of it. Oh. Okay. Yeah, hard, 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 hard. It's depressing, yeah. That yeah, is. So biosequestrants actually increase the rate at which we get rid of PCBs. So as you can see, avoid, support the body. When you've got something particularly high, okay, let's do something specific for that. Mm -hmm. So that would be from then, you'd have to get a prescription for that. You have to get a prescription for chlorestri yes. chlorestramine. Yes. Would you take, so you would take that even if you don't have mold? Oh, sure. So yeah, yeah, yeah. mold, as you know, the, the number of chemicals that mold produced, that chlorestramine will get rid of. Yeah, well. yeah. That's I'm talking about the PCBs and things like this. Yeah. Interesting. Oh, I never heard that before. And uh, not, not a lot of research on it. It's pretty frustrating. But what's there? Yeah. It's very, very good. Yeah. I'd only had heard about it being used for mold toxicity. So that's that's cool that it takes. Do you Have you done all this to yourself? <laughs> like, have you taken chlorestomy? Uh, I haven't. Um, no? The main one that I had trouble with was mercury. And okay. I was really surprised about that because I have no several fillings in my mouth. And I'm probably vegetarian when I do eat fish, I eat low mercury fish. But then as part of this project, I discovered that there's a lot of mercury in the air over the Pacific Northwest from coal burning in China. Oh, geez. There was an atmospheric sciences professor at University of Washington here, who um, every few years would get a grant from the federal government to take some really expensive equipment uh, in an airplane up and, and look at what's in the air over Seattle. He was surprised to find, I, I, I'm, I'm never with this guy talking to him, it's very interesting. He found all this mercury in the air over Seattle. So then he starts circling around the airplane, see where's it coming from, and quote, a river of mercury coming from China. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So I had, I had mercury levels. So I oh got high loose. And, I, I, and that's why I started using this oral DMSA uh, protocol and I got my mercury levels down. Wow. And so do you take your DMSA just, you know, one tab a day? There's some protocols that say you have to take it in its half-life so you don't get reabsorption. Yeah. So um, there's two huge factors here. Number one is dosage. Mm -hmm. And number two is once the DMSA is bound to the toxin, how to get out of the body. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, my protocol, I use it. I've got good data on this now with lots of people. I use 250 milligrams of DMSA every third night. So every three days, just 250 milligrams. But I also do 500 milligrams of NAC twice a day. And I do five grams of fiber three times a day. So you have to make sure you do a bunch of fiber 
uh, as well as well as the NSA to make sure that what's getting excreted is going to stay excreted and not get reabsorbed. Wow. And so you just do that every three days until you... So, you know, now, now fiber and NAC are every day. And DMSA only do every three days because um, yeah. I don't want things to go too fast. Yeah. So a, point, a, big, a big point I made in my book, uh, The Toxin Solution, is, yeah, the idea of detoxification is fine, but you have to make sure that you don't exceed your body's ability to get rid of toxins, tox the rate at which your body can get rid of toxins. So that's why I say before you go on a detox program, you got to clean up your gut. You got to make sure your liver's functioning properly. You got to get your kidneys functioning properly. Another new epidemic. And once they're functioning properly, now you can start getting rid of the toxins. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so your that's book... why I do the MSA lower levels. Right. And do you, but then do you continue taking it for a period of time, like every three days, and then stop for a while? Or so do you, you monitor. You yeah, monitor okay. your mercury levels and see, is it, and basically it's good for mercury and lead. A little bit for cadmium, not quite as good, mainly mercury and lead. Yeah. So you, you just monitor it. Yeah. And here's the good news. Good news is that you can get lead and mercury out of your body. The bad news is it takes about a year and a half. Yeah, right. Yeah, I've heard lead and that's assuming, years. And that's assuming you're not still putting it back in again with several <laughs> fillings and eating a lot of big fish and things of this nature. Yeah, yeah. So let's go through the protocol that's in the book because I love how you break it down. Like you were just talking about there about how there, you have to you have to set your body up. You can't just go jump into it. Now, I think most of my listeners, they've got the eating down. I think every everybody that listens to the show, I, I assume probably eat quite well. So your first two weeks is let's change the diet. Let's make sure we're eating well. And then you go into the next spot, which is the gut. And I think that that, I, I found that interesting. I thought the gut was going to come after getting rid of the toxins, but you mm -hmm. say clean up your, your gut first. All right. A couple of concepts here. As I say in the book, there's no point going on a detox protocol if you're letting the toxins keep coming in. So I said to people, here, it's been two weeks, get rid of the toxin exposures. Now, and by the way, if a person is really good at avoiding the toxins, particularly the non-persistent toxins, remember non-persistent hours to days to get rid of them, okay? Within two weeks, people will feel better right. because the body's starting to work better, okay? And if, you, and if you have diabetes, for example, you take an insulin, make sure you're monitoring your blood sugar levels because you may find that all of a sudden the insulin is working better, okay? So mm -hmm. two weeks, avoid the toxins. And if you don't feel better after two weeks, price tells some toxins coming in or maybe something else entirely different. Okay. And then we want to clean up the gut. All time naturopathic adage, disease begins in the gut. I mean, a hundred years ago, naturopaths were noticing people with gut disorders weren't digesting the food properly, bad breath and smelling stools, all these kinds of things. They have more disease. So you got to clean up the gut. And then there's two main problems with the gut. Number one is the wrong bacteria because of this modern use of all these antibiotics, we're putting way too much um, of the wrong bacteria into our guts. You mentioned before about the mother birthing a child and that child will get her gut flora. Well, if she had a C-section, she'll get the flora that's in the hospital. The flora in the hospital is the flora of sick people, okay? Yeah. <laughs> Not such a good thing. Okay, so a lot of people, they simply have the wrong bacteria in their gut. So you wanna reseed, you wanna kill off the bad bacteria and reseed with the good bacteria. Mm -hmm. The second part is gut permeability. So as we're being exposed to these viral toxins, when we're eating foods we're allergic to, when we're taking non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, like every time we take the acetaminophen or the aspirin or the ibuprofen, things like that, we actually cause loss of gut permeability. So whatever toxins are in the gut are now more easily absorbed. Mm -hmm. So you got to get rid of the toxin, the toxin producing bacteria in the gut, and you got to heal the gut mucosa so it stops letting these toxins in. Mm -hmm. Now you do that with golden mm -hmm. seal yeah. or part of it. Yeah, I love that. Now I, I've been meaning to look it up since I was reading your book, but I've used golden seal for probably you know, on and off for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And what it's from the same plant as berberine, correct? Uh, well, so um, you're, we say berberine. Berberine is the name of a chemical. Yeah. Are you talking about a, a class of plants like uh, Berberis aquifolia? Okay. No, it has berberine in it. Okay. 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 Right. Yeah. Because so I was thinking me, it was the same. Do one more thing. So, so why did I start with the gut? Yeah. So I start with the gut because that is actually the primary source of most people's toxins, and, and may, most people aren't aware of the, of the anatomy, but the blood coming from the gut 
you know, when, you're, when you've got your nutrients coming from the food and such, goes to liver first before it goes into general circulation because the blood is actually full of a lot of toxins if the gut's not functioning properly. So we can't clean up the liver until we stop poisoning it with abnormal molecules from the gut. That's where we start with the gut. So um, when I developed this protocol in 1976, by the way. Um, <laughs> That's the year I was born. <laughs> oh, well, good for you. <laughs> um, anyway, so um, I was looking, I, I was starting to realize the problem here. So I went to the library and, I, and this was way back when we didn't have the internet. So I had right. to go and actually get these physical journals and read them. It took me a lot of time. I started looking at, well, we know what kind of bacteria are bad. We know which bacteria are good. Are there any herbs or such that will kill the bad bacteria and leave the good bacteria alone? Golden cell. Turn the golden cell leaves the lactobacillus alone, but kills off the clostridia. So that worked really. That worked really well. Yeah. Then I had a bad thing happen. And when I first figured this out, a patient would come back to me and said, "Doc, what'd you do to me? I feel just so toxic. I followed your protocols." I said, "Why do you feel toxic when I clean your gut?" I write, "Oh, wait a minute. That's why they call it the practice of medicine." When you kill off all those toxic bacteria, they now release all their toxins as they're dying and overload people. So I said, oh yeah, you gotta put fiber in there too. Well, fiber again. You gotta put fiber in there to bind to the toxins that are being released as the bacteria die. Now we now now everything starts working properly. Nice. And then you seal the gut. Right. So you want to then so the gut will heal. Um, the cells lie in the gut are some of the most rapidly reproducing cells in the body. Uh, that's why when people do chemotherapy, which kills off rapidly produ uh, reproducing cells, that's why you get all the gut uh, mucosal problems and such. So they, they, re they repair very fast, which means you stop the damage and give them nutrients, it'll, fix, it'll heal itself really quickly. I was talking to a lab that uh, measures gut permeability with the lactulose mannitol test. And I asked, it, I asked them, I said, okay, well, once a person has stopped the damage to the gut, how soon does the test become normal? They say within a week. That's crazy. Yeah. So just stop the damage and give it the nutrients necessary. So what right. are nutrients that is necessary? Yeah. One example is, um, my wife, Laura, <laughs> uh, is the butyric acid produced by healthy gut bacteria from fiber. So when people are eating more fiber, they're getting more of the molecules necessary to heal the intestinal mucosa. Right. Crazy. And then from there, we start to uh, support the phase one, phase two detox pathways. So let's get into that. And now let's look at the, now look at the liver. Mm -hmm. So the main thing we have to do for the liver, although there are some detox protocols specific for the liver, the first thing is to make sure that the nutrients the liver needs to function properly are there. So as you know, we have kind of phase one and phase two enzymes in the liver. In general, phase one either directly detoxifies things or converts them to a form that's more easily uh, metabolized by phase two uh, for getting rid of them. Now, unfortunately, in between the phase one and phase two, these compounds that are being produced are actually more toxic. So if you want phase one to work the best it can, but you've got to be sure phase two is working the way it's supposed to. Okay, here's a big problem. All the phase one enzymes are based on heme. So they're iron dependent. So if you have a woman who's anemic, she's gonna have a problem with her phase one detox enzymes. So there's one area that needs, needs to be dealt with. Okay. So iron, and then when you start looking at what, what are all the nutrients necessary for phase one to work properly? What are all the nutrients necessary for phase two to work properly? Turns out all the nutrients known to be important for human physiology are important for, for detoxification as well. If you wonder how important detoxification is, the body spends about 25% of the energy produced every day for detoxification purposes. So it's not only detoxification of chemicals and metals in the environment, but all our metabolism produces molecules we have to get rid of, like homocysteine. Homocysteine is, is a metabolic waste product. We have to get rid of it. There are a lot of these things in the body, and that's what the liver does. It spends a lot of energy to get rid of things we don't need after, after they've done their job. Mm -hmm. Now, I noticed that in, your, in the protocol that you talk about, there's... One of the most famous liver herbs is milk thistle, which you don't have in your protocol. Any reason uh, why? It may not be in the protocol everywhere, but it's definitely in, in the Oh, protocol. okay. <laughs> I mean, it may, it may got left out one of the tables, but yeah, it's definitely in there. Yeah, milk thistle oh. is a great, a great herb. Okay. And, you know, the way it works primarily is by increasing production of glutathione. Oh, when you okay. increase production of glutathione, 
it's very helpful. Now, here's the key factor. So you talk about the um, phase one detoxifying molecules. For every molecule that phase one detoxifies, it also produces one molecule of oxidant. And then glutathione binds to that one molecule of oxidant to make sure it doesn't damage the body. Well, when the liver is overloaded with detoxification, like they ate a toxic mushroom. The way toxic mushrooms kill us is by destroying our livers. Because when the liver tries to detoxify the toxins in mushrooms, it produces so much oxidants, it overwhelms the glutathione, and then the oxidants then damage the liver. Oh, wow. So don't eat poison mushrooms, everyone. Yeah, don't eat poison <laughs> mushrooms. Right. But to give you an idea how good this is, it used to be in Germany, that when a person came in with uh, mushroom poisoning, they give them IV milk thistle because it did such a great job of increasing glutathione production to then protect them from the damage from the, from the mushrooms. Wow. Yeah, and you use lots of artichoke, dandelion. Now those are phase one? Those are more cholagogs. So they kind of help clean out stuff that's in the liver. Right. That's mainly what they do. Yeah, and, and acetylcysteine. And what about glut like uh, liposomal glutathione? Do you ever use that? Right, liposomal glutathione, topical glutathione, they're useful. IV glutathione, as long as the person doesn't have, doesn't have high mercury levels. Um, I also use an inhaled glutathione. So if a person has a COPD, uh, where they're lo losing their uh, respiratory, respiratory function, you can give them an inhaled glutathione, they can get respiratory function back. Hmm. Um, where do you get topical glutathione? I looked it up, I couldn't find Health it. Star. Really? Okay, mm -hmm. I'll have to look. I didn't look at the health food. I didn't. I tried to look online for it, and I couldn't really. Find, oh, I don't think I saw any. Be, yeah, I I haven't had trouble getting this. So I don't know okay. the problem. Oh, oh, you're in Canada. I'm in Canada, so I'm wondering oh, yeah, if it's so, maybe not here. So one of the challenges is that the laws on natural products are different in Canada than in the U.S. So yeah. Some things I use here, you may not have access to in Canada, and vice versa. Yeah, I think we're a lot more strict here. I think we've removed a lot of things off our shelf in the last 10 years. So, yes, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. And I tried the oral liposomal glutathione and I found it made me f not feel good at all. Mm -hmm. I felt sick and my it gave me a headache. So I was like, well, no, not for me. So I, I listen, just listen do, to your body. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. So the last part, which I think is really interesting because this has to do with when women lose weight, especially on, if they're doing a quick fix weight loss protocol and not, nobody realizes that when you quickly lose weight, you are filling your body full of toxins. And a lot of women will regain that weight plus some because they've released these obesogens, these toxins into the body. But interesting enough, and I've, and I've heard this quite a few times now, which is as part of detoxification though, you need to be in a calorie restriction or need to be doing calorie restriction. You need to be allowing that fat to be released and those toxins to be released. So let's talk about that. Uh, yes. So I'm glad you brought that up. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the ways in which the body protects itself from these toxins, many, which, many of them are fat soluble, particularly ones that have the longest half-lives in the body. The body sequesters them in fat. Okay. And some people theorize that the reason they're obesogens is because the body is intentionally producing more fat to dilute the toxins. So if you lose weight at a rate faster than the body can get rid of the toxins, you can actually make people more toxic. And many of these toxins poison the thyroid. We talk about the T4 to T3 conversion. A lot of these things block that conversion. So what happens is you start losing weight. Oh, I lost some weight. I feel good about it. I'll say, wait. I don't have any energy and now I got, I got brain fog and well, oh, I'm getting kind of hungry more and it's all these too many chemicals. And you'll, you'll remember from the case histories in my book, The Toxin Solution, I give case histories of people who came in who are way, overweight and said, I want to go to a weight loss program. I said, no, um, not now. Let's first detox, detoxify you. They lost weight. It's a lost toxins without getting adverse reactions. Wow. So you got to prepare the body for detoxification and don't go faster than your body can get rid of. I much prefer slow detox, slow weight loss programs that over time, not only get people to change their behaviors, but also then allow the body enough time to get rid of these things before more are being released. Yeah, yeah, super important, I think, hey? But it can be such a, an amazing weight loss tool. Yes. Yeah, like just get rid of the toxins first. I think that, that there's so much more of that than we think. 
these people that have really stubborn, I work with women with weight loss resistance. And I'm just starting to think more, especially after reading your book, that one of these main causes, same with the hormone dysfunction, is these toxins. Yeah. Well, I, I want to go a little further on this. Yeah. Um, I, want, I, I want, don't want people to misunderstand me. Um, morbid obesity is really bad, period. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But some level of overweight, uh, not, it's not bad. So mm -hmm. let's think this through. So remember, we developed our metabolic systems as we evolved as a species. And as we evolved as a species, there are times of famine. Remember, we tend to be nomadic. We tend to go where the food was, which means there are periods of time where we didn't have food. So we pre-selected our population for people who are good at storing fat so they could survive when not enough calories were around. So it's not the fat that's causing the trouble. Okay, remember what I just said. Overweight people, lowest percent of body load of environmental toxins, they don't have more diabetes. Overweight people who exercise regularly don't have more cardiovascular disease. So it's not the fat, it's the lifestyle that's associated with the fat that causes the trouble. So if you don't exercise, your heart's not gonna work very well. I don't care whether you're fat or not. And if you're full of toxins, your body's not work, gonna work very well, don't care if you're fat or not, okay? Yeah. So don't worry so much about body weight, worry about what's in that fat. Wow, yeah, exactly. Interesting. Okay, great. I love it. I, th I think that's it. So at the end, we do a calorie. Then once we set these detoxification pathways up, at the end of it, you say calorie restriction in order to mobilize some more toxins. And anything else, like, do you think we should be doing saunas every day, exercise, like sweating? Um, so some people little, do enemas, coffee yeah, enemas. So two little tweaks to what you just said. Also notice I said, and a slightly alkalinizing diet. Oh. People have heard this idea about acid forming diet being bad for you. Well, there's actually research to support that. But the key factor is that as evolved as a species, we're, we're on an alkaline forming diet. And the alkaline forming diet makes it easier for cells to get rid of toxins, but more importantly, it, gets, it makes it easier for the kidneys to get rid of toxins. So it's not only a mild caloric restriction, it's also an alkalinization. That's really quite, quite important. Right, and is that why you remove the meat? That's why I decrease the meat because meat is high in sulfur-containing amino acids mm -hmm. and the sulfur-containing amino acids are a primary source of acidity. And the other one is salt. And salt, and what's important here is that when people consume too much salt, which is the vast majority of the population, it impairs the kidney's ability to get rid of toxins because it's having to get rid of the excess salt. Right, yeah, all right. So calorie restriction, do we do some Oh, and then finally saunas. Saunas, we do saunas, yeah. yeah. I think saunas are a great way to detoxify. So yeah. sweat freely, do a lot of fluids. Um, and again, if you slightly alkalinize your body while you're doing it, so I use, um, I make a little drink up with some magnesium and potassium uh, citrate in it, and that is alkalinizing. So it makes it easier for the body to get rid of the toxins. Great. And do, what, where's your, what's your take on the coffee enemas? That seems to be a very popular thing to, to produce glutathione. It, it, it was popular in the past. I don't, I don't, I don't have a good answer for whether yeah, okay. it's a good idea or not. I, I just, I mean, people I respect have done it, but you know, I'm really research driven and I, I, it's not clear to me. Right. Yes. Okay. <laughs> it is, it's become, it's, it's having a surge of popularity again, oh, just so it? you know. Yeah. Thanks, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it sounded, when I researched myself, it did sound very helpful because it, it was something like, you would increase your glutathione levels by like 700% by doing a coffee enema. Like it was, you a study? it was crazy. Do you have a study that you could uh, send to me? I'll I'd try and find it that. again. Yeah. And I'll okay. and send it to you. I was just oh, that, recent. That, so that it should be, be in my phone. Very, very intriguing. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, oh, well that's huge. So yes, I'll send it to you. All right. So you guys can get Dr. Pizorno's was the toxin solution. You can find it on Amazon. I think is where I bought mine from. Super easy to read, very easy. Like, I just love how you just put it all together because if you start to go online and start researching how to do a liver detox, you get some really bad information and some really bad products. There's a lot of products that just go into phase one detoxification where they're gonna release all these, these toxins into your body. But if you don't have the phase two to bring them out, 
you get, they reabsorb, you get sick. And so unfortunately I would say what I see in a health food store is like 90% wrong because they're not doing all pathways of the detoxification. So you, the way you've set it up is very nice. I feel like it's, it's very safe way to detoxify the body. So how many times a year do we do this? Do you think? That's on the person. Mm -hmm. Um, My recommendation is that people do a sauna once a week. Mm -hmm. of at least of with at least 20 minutes of heavy sweating now not everybody's going to do that i have trouble doing it myself once a week but also i work really hard to avoid the toxins but that's about what what people need to do yeah okay and is there things that we can take on a daily basis that would help just to keep the toxins out so the uh, the fiber and Mm -hmm. the uh, nac are the two most obvious uh, easiest thing to do to decrease toxins Okay. And there are things like the bottom line is you have to eat organically grown foods. Okay. There's no way around it. Yes. I think that that's really key. And also not, don't eat conventionally raised meat. Don't eat conventionally raised meat. Don't eat farm fish. Never eat farm fish. They have a lot of PCBs in them. You can't get rid of them. Mm -hmm. Don't do mercury fillings. Don't do mercury fillings. Still so many being put in. It's ridiculous. But yes. All right. Thank you, Dr. Pizzorno. This has been awesome. I appreciate you coming on the show today. Great chat with you and thank you for your important work.